My dear friends, today is Passion Sunday. It is also the Feast of St. Cyril of Jerusalem. My dear friend, St. Bonaventure says that he who desires to advance in virtue should meditate upon the passion of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. St. Augustine says something very astounding. He says, A single tear shed at the remembrance of the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ is worth more than a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, is worth more than fasting for a year on bread and water. And St. Paul said that he desired to know nothing but Jesus, Jesus Christ crucified. St. Thomas Aquinas had the privilege, as did St. Bonaventure, of being friends. Two great intellectual saints in the same time, close enough that they could appreciate each other's company. One day, St. Thomas Aquinas was over at St. Bonaventure's place, church. I don't know if it's a monastery. And he asked St. Bonaventure, who was famous for all of his sermons and lessons that he taught to the Catholics and to converts alike, he asked St. Bonaventure, what was this book that he used to prepare his talks from? St. Bonaventure motioned for him to come, and he showed him an image of Christ crucified. The image was blackened by the many kisses that St. John, St. Bonaventure had showered upon our Lord. He says, it is from this image that I learn all that I know, what little I know. By meditation upon the sufferings of our Lord Jesus Christ. It was the meditation upon the sufferings of our Lord that procured for St. Francis the title of the seraph as an angel burned the wounds into the hands and side and head of St. Francis of Assisi. St. Francis, very much like St. Peter, wept every time he thought of the Passion, such that it almost blinded St. Francis. He, asked why, he was asked why he wept at the thought of our Lord's suffering. And he said, it's because there are so many that are so forgetful of the cross. Let it not be said of us, which probably could be said of most today. I want to turn our, your attention, please, and our consideration to fasting. Fasting of itself is not a virtue. The good fast, the bad fast, the pagan fast, the Christian fast. It is virtuous only when it is accompanied by conditions which make it render it pleasing to Almighty God. And my dear friends, our fast, as you know, is exterior, but it must also be accompanied by an interior fast, a mortification of the spirit as well as the body to draw strength and efficiency <coughs> from fasting something more than abstinence is from the prohibited is necessary consider the fruits of fasting it fortifies the spirit strengthens it while at the same time it mortifies the flesh it lifts up the spirit it elevates it it fights the base inclinations of mankind concupiscence and it gives a special power to the individual to deaden sinful passions fasting purifies the heart disposing it to be pleasing and to please almighty god there are also three conditions for fasting. First, my dear friends, it must be done wholeheartedly. It must be done willingly, earnestly, 
It must be done entirely. St. Bernard says, Fasting was instituted by our Lord as a remedy for the mouth. How did sin enter into the world? Sin entered into the world by the mouth. When Adam and Eve chose not to fast or abstain from a certain tree, sin enters the world by the senses, and thus we must mortify all of our senses. Fasting helps us to do that. Fasting helps with all the senses. It helps the eyes to guard itself against unlawful gazes. It helps the ears to say no to the calumnies and detractions our neighbor wishes to tell us. It helps the mouth to speak truth and to speak charity. It helps the hands and the sense of touch, especially against impurity, violence, and injustice. Some of the early Christians were so strict, my dear friends, to practice that interior fast that they would not even talk to the other Christians the entirety of Lent. They would refrain from these activities. Secondly, the second condition is that we never fast through vanity, but we try to do so in all humility. For as we saw in the Gospel of Quinquagesima Sunday, fasting without charity is nothing. Even the pagans fasted, and to God it was nothing, because they didn't believe in him. They weren't doing it for his holy will. We have to fast in happy contentment, without grumbling, without complaining, without being on edge, because we're hungry. But it's very important not to complain about the laws of the church. It's very important to, for your non-Catholic friends to see that when the church requires us to fast, we do so ha happily, willingly. For if we do it unwillingly or grumbling, we gain no merit, says St. Paul. To fast poorly is displeasing to God, as it is fasting through self-will in the manner we choose, how we wish to fast. Do not fast, my dear friends, as you want, but as you ought. Do not fast because it's your will, but because it's God's will. Make his will your will, rather than your will his will. <coughs> Scripture reminds us not to look gloomy or melancholic when we fast, to wash our faces, so to speak, to be cheerful. This is the fast which is commanded by the church. Let your modesty be made known so that you may joyfully obey the laws of God. Don't amuse yourself with what everyone else is doing as far as their fast and their sacrifices for Lent. To see what they're eating, what they are not eating. Do not fast more than the community or less than your neighbor, but fast as they fast, so that you not appear to be better than they, or want to be better, or think you're better than they. Accomplish your extra penances in private, but let your modesty, as Scripture says, be known to all. The third condition, my dear friends, of fasting to please the God is look to God in your fasting and keep your eyes focused on His holy will. It profits us nothing to do what we're doing for the eyes of the world. It profits us everything to do what we're doing for the eyes of God. Adam was commanded to fast, even in the garden. He was commanded to abstain from a certain tree, even at the loss of life. Adam and Eve took counsel from the serpent and they valued food and a certain knowledge over eternal life. We saw their great mistake. We suffer from it today. 
Saint Pacomius was a famous saint, monk, abbot, who had 3,000 monks in his monastery. They had very good cooks in the monastery, simple but good. They cooked their food very well. Children had collected, were drawn to the monastery for education. One Lent, St. Pacomius had to leave the monastery for a visitation of another religious house. He would be gone a number of weeks during Lent. During those weeks, the monks decided to do extra penances and make life more austere. And so they decided to not cook any of the food, but to eat the vegetables and other foods raw. This was hard on the stomach of the kids in particular. In their, t in their spare time now, since they weren't cooking their meals, they made mats and baskets to sell for the monastery. When St. Pacomius came home, the children were all too eager to greet and meet him. And one or two of them perhaps mentioned to him that the brother monks aren't cooking the food anymore. St. Pacomius wasn't too happy. He went into the kitchen, he asked what was going on. And the monks showed him the mats and the baskets they had made for sale for the monastery. St. Pacomius had them burned, just consumed, destroyed. And he rebuked the brothers, not only for the kids' sake, but for obedience' sake. They weren't supposed to be making mats for the monastery. They were supposed to be cooking the food for the brothers and the children. And so, let us do what the church requires of us and commands us to do. It's much better, much more profitable for us to follow her laws than for us to make selection of our own rules of Lent, our own penances. And remember the beautiful words of St. Augustine, one tear shed in memory of the passion of our Lord is worth more than a pilgrim or years fasting on bread and water. God love you and God bless you. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, amen.